Hi all, we're gonna get ready to get started here. Uh, we are here for City Council Bill 20-0557, Baltimore City Administrative Procedure Act regulations. Uh, this is the Judiciary Committee, Councilman Eric Costello from the 11th District, Chair of the Committee. I am joined by Councilman John Bullock, 9th District, member of the committee, uh, Councilwoman Shannon Sneed, 13th District, member of the committee, Councilman Leon Pinkett, 7th District, member of the committee, Councilman Robert Stokes, 12th District, member of the committee, uh, and Councilman Ryan Dorsey, uh, 3rd District, uh, who is co-sponsor of the bill with Councilwoman Shannon Sneed. Uh, joining us from, the, uh, from Mayor Young's office is Matt Stegman and Nina Themelis. Joining us from Council President Brandon Scott's office uh, is Kaylin Young. I know we're going to be hearing extensively from Vic Tervola from the Department of Law and Tony DeFranco from uh, the Department of Legislative Reference. Um, we are going to start off with um, um, this is this. <laughs> I think there's a lot of complicated detail in this bill. It's one of the reasons that we had a number of meetings um, prior to, to this hearing uh, with agency officials um, and, and uh, the president's office and the mayor's office to really you know, work through uh, some of the nuance in the bill. So I appreciate the two co-sponsors for your willingness uh, to do that, to, to I think get us to a place where we can have a, a much more smooth hearing. Uh, I expect this to be a, a lengthy hearing uh, at a minimum. Uh, so with that, I'm going to defer to Councilwoman Sneed and or Councilman Dorsey for brief introductory remarks before we get started. Uh, I'll go. Good morning, everyone. Um, this is, I know as council members, we've heard um, and we've seen a lot of our constituents reach out to us for a number of different things. And sometimes it often doesn't make sense to another group of why we're doing certain things or why we ask for studies. And uh, we just want it to all make sense as council members. And so this bill is really a good way of um, understanding why we do certain things, having rules and regulations. So um, we're just not working on one half of the, uh, the city, but we are um, essentially uh, have a process of why we're doing something in a process for um, Baltimore City residents to find more information on uh, different laws that we want to do um, and different uh, policies that we want to see that will affect the everyday citizen. So this is why we essentially are doing this bill. And like you said, it's, it is very complex and convoluted in a way, but it still makes sense. Um, every other jurisdiction has it when we're talking about Howard County, Montgomery County to Prince George's County, even the federal government and the state um, have a rules and regulations uh, act. So um, I'll kick it over to my colleague, uh, Councilman Ryan Dorsey. Thank you, Councilman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, for the opportunity to hear this bill and to uh, explain, um, you know, how I see this. Um, and, you know, as usual, uh, my colleague, Councilwoman Sneed, is able to speak to the kind of everyday citizens kind of concerns while I'm kind of the guy going, well, here's the little wonky little details and the technicalities and all that. So I just want to take a moment to... Um, review uh, a little bit of what this bill does or the, the kind of the broad strokes of what this bill does um, uh, for everybody here. Um, as a reminder, some have, may have read this bill, you know, weeks, uh, weeks ago or so. Um, the bill creates a, a basic process by which agencies um, can adopt rules and regulations. We have no formalized, standardized process for the city. As Councilwoman Sneed said, um, other other jurisdictions throughout Maryland have this. In fact, we're the only major jurisdiction that doesn't have it. Every single state in the country has an Administrative Procedures Act, and of course, the federal government has one. Um, we are the only jurisdiction in the state that does not have one, a major jurisdiction. Um, and so this creates a formal process um, 
that does not exist now that uh, requires agencies to submit uh, proposed rules and regulations to the law department to have them reviewed uh, for legality um, before then going up for a public uh, comment period for 30 days, um, at, only after which may the rule or regulation go into effect um, and during which time uh, the council has an opportunity to put the brakes on things if we see that um, it, that the rule or regulation uh, is not in keeping with the intent of the law that authorized the rule or regulation to be created. If we say, hey, look, you guys are like really missing the mark here. We can hold a hearing on this. We can hold it up. We can, you know, speak to the public about it and the public can increase their public comment to the agency saying we don't think that this rule or regulation uh, hits the mark. Um, uh, this also allows for DLR to go back through the code for all the various places where the code currently says to adopt a rule or regulation, you have to do X, Y, and Z, um, uh, which changes from one section of the code to the next, one subtitle to the next. Um, it allows DLR to go back through there and find all of those places and update them to say that if you're creating a rule or regulation under this subtitle, it has to go through the APA process. Um, we have, uh, and then finally, it also creates, um, as other jurisdictions have, or you know, many are familiar with COMAR. Um, uh, in addition to the laws of the jurisdiction uh, listed like we have now on DLR's website as the city code, we would also have the what we're calling the COBRA, the Code of Baltimore Regulations annotated. Um, so not just the Code of Laws, but we would have also DLR codifying the Code of Regulations. Um, and uh, that would be like the state's COMAR is a searchable database, a, a central repository of all agencies, rules and regulations. Um, we would keep that. And again, this is something that other jurisdictions have that we're long overdue to have. Um, and so I'm glad to have this uh, opportunity to work on this bill. I want to thank the chair of the committee we're convening a series of meetings with the council president's office, with the mayor's office, with myself and Councilwoman Sneed, uh, as well as with DLR and the law department over the course of more than a month, um, really getting through a lot of concerns about this. That allowed us to be able to prepare amendments so that we can hopefully move forward with this bill today. So thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councilman. Uh, it looks like we're ready to get started. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to turn it over to Department of Legislative Reference first. Tony, if you want to kick things off uh, from DLRs. Sure. We, good morning. Uh, we stand by our report. Um, we very much support this bill in concept, but we're a little apprehensive that um, our current resources would not be able to um, withstand the, the additional duties that you'd be giving us. Um, so our bill report does note that, and we are asking somewhere in the neighborhood of one to two additional staff members um, to carry out these new duties. Mr. Chair, may I ask a question? Please. Thank you. Tony, um, in our meetings, one of the things we talked about also, and I think this applies to the law department as well, is kind of the front loading of um, kind of the burden that this, that this bill would create. Uh, on the front end, uh, you would have to establish the, the COBRA, um, the whole system for codification, and you would have to actually put a lot of information into it. Similarly, the law department would have to review a lot of um, rules and regs that are being submitted by agencies, in, particularly in the first year. Um, and that before they come over to DLR, uh, I know that in those conversations, we talked about the law department, maybe needing some, um, maybe being able to handle that through some temporary staffing during that period. Um, is it also the case with DLR that there, that you feel like there would be a 
temporary staffing need for an exceptionally heightened level of uh, of work, and that perhaps after that it, it might become more tenable well, the long, over the long term. To be sure, I think that um, the the two staff member I think accounts for that potential surge in. Uh, everybody rushing to get their regulations codified within that one period. I think uh, to sustain us, um, we would need probably a, a one permanent staff member from now until the future. That answers my question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would just note um, that you'll not get any argument from me. I've always been advocating for DLR to have more staff, and so I will continue to do so. Thank you. Um, let's jump over to law department. Victor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This is Vic Turvola from the city law department. Um, we are grateful to have the meetings that we had on this particular issue so we can sort of clarify some of these things and some of them have been. I wrote a bill report that's, that talks about four different types of amendments in here. I know uh, Councilman Sneed and Council, uh, Councilwoman Sneed and, and Councilman Dorsey have amendments that'll take care of, I think, some of those um, and uh, or probably, probably perhaps most. Um, let me talk about the amendments that I have just in, in briefly, I think. The amendment that we were seeking uh, deals with uh, the ability of the committee, as this bill is written, the committee has the ability to basically veto a regulation, and we thought that went too far. So we were looking for amendments that uh, took care of that particular problem. The uh, amendments, uh, the proposed amendments that I have from uh, Councilwoman Sneed and, and Councilmember Dorsey uh, are uh, take care of that particular issue. Uh, the next one I have uh, deals with uh, the uh, elimination of obsolete provisions. Uh, I just, uh, it's, there's a, it's not terribly clear that you can eliminate obsolete provisions. So we wanted to be clear. And so we have a little line that basically clarifies that, which I think is more technical in nature than, than substantive. Vic, uh, um, can we jump to that one for a second? Sure. Um, uh, that is in line, that is page 10, Mr. Chair. Mm -hmm. Line 14. Yeah, so I was looking at that, that language and just thinking if an agency has been abolished, the agency is not able to conclude that a provision is obsolete. So does it make sense? Well, to it's have, not. I'm sorry. Does, does it make sense to have language in there that says has since been an, abolished or an agency concludes is obsolete? uh that would be fine uh that that would be fine i mean the, the i thought i was it was just a, it was just an odd phrasing and i didn't really and the idea that a, an agency has been obsolete or has been abolished that you couldn't get rid of the re regulations i guess that probably is, is 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 correct so mr chair i would agree with your with your uh, revision there um moving may on I ask, may I ask for clarification here yeah yeah, um, to, I want to read this whole section here, um, 4404, starting on, on line 10. With the approval of the city solicitor. Tell us, the, what, what, page, what page are you on, Bill? Page 10, sorry. Part, page 10, beginning on line 10. Thank you. With the approval of the city solicitor, an agency may request that the director remove from the code um, a part of a regulation that has been held unconstitutional by a court of competent final jurisdiction. I'm going to skip that. Say a regulation adopted by an agency that has been abolished. So is this saying that if um, I'm just going to use an absurd example, if DOT were abolished, then the health department could make a request that the director remove uh, a, a, a regulation that had previously been adopted by OT, the, by DOT. Hey, Victor, can you uh, jump on mute, please? Thank you. Uh, no, Councilman, I, I think the, the example I would 
me, let me give a ridiculous example in, in response to that. But part one deals with, I, I think part one is very straightforward, right? Yeah, just, just to get forget straight. about that, yeah. Part two, um, let's say, um, uh, I'll give you a great example. Let's say your bill passes on the, the homeless. office for, for homeless services. Yeah. Any rules and regs that the previous agency that's dealt with this, which no longer exists, which is the Mayor's Office of Human Services, prior to the Mayor's Office of Homeless Services, um, those would automatically be abolished. And then there would be a third piece in here that would say, uh, if the Department of, let's say, for example, the Department of Public Works uh, no longer needed a rule or reg for a program that was a relief program for the pandemic, and it expired after a year, because at some point, hopefully, we'll be out of the pandemic. That rule and reg is no longer necessary. The DPW director could say, I find that we don't need this, this rule and reg in, in the COBRA anymore. I think that's where I was getting at with it. Although, my I suppose there's a fourth piece to it in terms of a successor agency, for example, if the Mayor's Office of Human Services had some type of rule and reg in place, and then they are, their functionality is consumed by if your bill passes this new office, then should that new office have the ability to say, well, we've consumed all that functionality. We want to eliminate a rule and reg because we feel it's no longer relevant to what we do. Uh, my, my thought is in the case where there isn't a successor office, if agency A becomes obsolete, uh, or become, uh, is if a agency A is abolished, who is the agency then afterward to request that that abolished agency's rules and regs be eliminated from the code? Because it doesn't say that the abolished agency's rules and regs automatically disappear. It says that an agency has to request that they be removed. So, can I, can, I jump, can I jump in? Semantics, I don't know. Yeah, sure, but, please. Yeah, yeah, can, I mean, I think if the, the issue is if we still have laws on the books that need interpretation, even if an agency disappears, the law still exists, and we would still require the interpretation, presumably. So in, in a way, we're sort of, you know, we, we've, I think actually this is a great discussion because maybe there's some things we need to tweak with further amendments just to be clear about it. But the situation that you're talking about, I think in most cases, we will still, we will still have the law, but we won't have the agency. Somebody will be responsible for carrying out that, that particular law. So I don't think we're ever gonna be totally in that situation that you're talking about, but occasionally we might be. Um, and then in that case, we would really do want to have the responsibility of whoever is the successor agency of being able to say, well, this law it really isn't on the books anymore or whatever it is that it's been changed substantially. So we don't have to have this regulation, anymore. which I think we have the situation where we can say the agency in, in my in my amendment here, the agency concludes is obsolete. So assuming that's the agency that takes over whatever responsibility is for the for the for the interpreting that particular law. So, um, to, I guess I want to support council, the chair's um, position here that I think we should retain the existing language and um, not substitute it as in the law department's amendment request, but add an or and have both of these provisions. Is that the suggestion, Mr. Chair? I think so, yes. Vic, what are your thoughts? That looks uh, that looks sufficient to me, Mr. Chair. So I, I think you know. Uh, let's 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 go that way. Tony, do you have any uh, feedback on that one? I don't. This is completely. Um, I think that everybody is touching on the same thing, and I think it's up to the committee as to whether you would want to add a third reason for this process to kick in. Okay. You don't see any concerns there. No. Uh, Mayor's office.
I, I mean, if uh, there's no concerns from the agency, I don't believe there's any concerns from us. Council President's office? Kaylin? I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm on the phone with the President. Can you repeat the question? Um, are there are there any concerns with adding in a third option here, uh, which would address what was in uh, the law department's agency comments letter, basically saying that we would be adding in an or if an agency concludes that a rule or regulation is obsolete? Uh, I mean, at first, I mean, I'm sorry, I was a little distracted. And like I said, I was on this call. So at first thought it doesn't sound like a problem okay mr chair may i, I just thought of something and yep. there could be a subjectivity as to what is considered obsolete i think that i mean having worked with the state um when an agency when a state agency wants to repeal a, a particular amendment they usually have to go through the apa process again um and so I, I, there might be an issue, I guess if the law, de, I mean, I guess my thought would be if the law department signing off that it's truly obsolete and not just a repeal, then perhaps it's fine. My fear would be if the agency is trying to repeal something, uh, let's say it's extremely popular program, they're trying to repeal the regulations for it, and they're trying to use this mechanism as a backdoor for that. That would be my only concern. Okay. Makes sense. Um, anyone else have anything to add on this one before we jump to the third set of issues? All right, back to you, Victor. Thank you. Um, my, uh, my next concern was uh, the law department is given responsibility for approving the form, the conformity of regulations with the uh, style manual of, of Department of Legislative Reference. Um, as I say in my uh, uh, report, a lot of lawyers aren't style mavens, uh, and we really don't want that responsibility. Uh, on the other hand, uh, I had a conversation with Councilman Dorsey just uh, in advance of this hearing, and he was pointing out that he didn't think it would be um, much of a burden for us to do. My, my, my response uh, to take a look at what the form is, uh, one of the issues I didn't want to get involved with was basically the law department approving on form uh, and then going to legislative reference, who really is the, the keeper of the form, um, and then the legislative reference saying, no, no, uh, you guys have messed it up. Go back and, and revise the amendment. I didn't want to get caught in that sort of back and forth. On the other hand, um, if we basically approve the form and not necessarily all the little uh, stop uh, requirements and a legislative reference can, and for example, let me give you an idea of what I'm talking about. You know, if we're just talking about whether or not we have something that says this is this is in conformity to, to such and such a law, uh, we have a title, we have that kind of stuff, but we don't we don't necessarily pass or legislative reference has all these numbering, uh, a quaint numbering systems that we need to use, um, uh, outlining uh, situations. Uh, if we don't necessarily put it in that order, I didn't want to have a law department basically be doing all that when I think at the end of the day, that would be a, a legislative reference function. So to the extent uh, we can approve this language as written, I just would want to make it clear that the law department doesn't want to be in the process or in the, in the position of having to um, really uh, delve into and rehash the rewriting of something just to make it conform to legislative references um, style manual. Tony. Yeah. Well, I think that um, that was that language was included in there first because uh, the law department is going to be the first agency outside of the promulgating agency to ever set eyes on this a proposed regulation, and 
they would have the the ability to sort of do a first glance and i don't think the intention was that they get every stylistic or how built how certain things are numbered and things like that um i i i think that it is a fairly innocuous responsibility under this bill that i mean they 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 approve things for form and legal sufficiency right now um so I, I don't see it working outside of that sort of paradigm and and as i as i as i said tony i, I just didn't want to get into a match with you guys saying and you guys didn't do it right now what we can do of course is if it get, if it looks really bad we can send it back to the agency and say look of course. put it and, put it together and then it comes back to us and we say yeah okay good so uh it's just a matter of at the end of the day i didn't want to be in a match with you guys uh, but if we have that sort of agreement, and I'm hoping we can keep that agreement when you and I are gone, uh, then um, you know we're going to be okay with the language as written. And I wouldn't anticipate there to be any disagreement, given that um, Section 4403 of the bill allows DLR to sort of go back and sort of clean up very minor uh, stylistic things. For instance, the, the one that jumps out is you know a lot of times agencies will want to say something like uh, a person shall not do this. Well, you know, the, the, the form and the style that the state has adopted and the, that we have adopted is the proper is a person may not do this. And that's the, that's the kind of thing that we would change. And we wouldn't go back to the law department and say, I can't believe you guys approve this. Um, we would just change it. So yeah, we don't expect there to be any dis disagreements so where where do we where does that leave us on this one it, are changes necessary mr chair i think we're okay with the language as written here okay so we can we can move past this one yes okay uh council members sneed and dorsey do you have anything to add or you're good to move on I think that that uh, I'll express as a conversation I had with Victor before the hearing started that we don't need the law department's um, bill report changes. I think we're okay with the first reader language. Correct. I agreed. Great. Great. Okay. So moving on to the fourth one, which is on the top of page four. Victor. You're on mute, Victor. Kind of refresh my memory what this one is um oh this is uh this is our, our concern is about uh, really hosting a, a database um in uh, as it says in my report this seems to me an easy thing for our it department to do um the way this works now under the bill is that an agency sends its first draft of a proposal to us we review it the law department reviews it and then if we approve it, uh, then the agency puts up the, um, announces it on their website that they've got a, a proposed regulation and they put a link to the actual uh, language of the regulation. Um, when I was looking at this bill, I, I thought, well, that's an easy thing for BCIT to basically collect from the agencies. Basically, they can put write a program, I'm assuming they can write a program that would gather those proposed regulations off of all the agencies uh, and basically create that report themselves. And I didn't want to have the law department uh, be doing something similar uh, when it would be such a, a remote and easy thing, I think, for uh, BCIT to do. We simply don't have the staff to put together a, 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 a sort of a compendium of proposed regulations to monitor that. But in my conversation with uh, Councilman Dorsey just before that, I said, look, if, as long as BCIT can do that legwork, that create a program, gather it up, the law department would be fine with hosting it on our, on our website. Um, I originally had that idea for legislative reference, but frankly, if BCIT is able to do all that work, it doesn't matter if it's on our website or on uh, legislative references left, website. I just want to make it clear that we are not in a we're not really in a position to be able to gather that information have the staff have that kind of expertise to do but bcit is yeah i think that makes that seems to make sense to me i you know as, as i read this it's law department will maintain the list you would essentially be the keeper of the list but the agency has some type of responsibility 
to post notice on their website that there is a proposed rule that law department has put on the master list, if you will. Um, this should be as simple as uh, you all logging, whoever maintains your website when you have to add new content that's specifically related to the Department of Law, whoever that person is going in and just submitting on, a, on an electronic form or, or uploading or posting a new blog entry or, or however it's done on the back end of, of Law's website. So I, I don't think the intention here, and I don't want to speak for the sponsors, but was to ever have you come up with um, some technical solution that's touching every agency in, in the city and interacting with DLR and everything else. Am, am I correct to the co-sponsors? Correct. And remember, this is one of the things we talked about um, with just having that main source for people to get the information. Right. Okay. Yeah, it just, it seems it's something on the phone. That Councilman Reisinger? I think we have like yeah. four or five people unmuted right now. I'm good. I'm listening. Can you hear me? Hey, Matt, can you uh, make sure that everyone on the phone is muted with the exception of Councilman Reisinger? Uh, yes, Mr. Chair. Councilman Reisinger is the only unmuted caller. Got it. Thank you, sir. Go ahead, Councilman Dorsey. You're on mute, Councilman. Dang it. Um, the, the point here is simply that the public should have one central place to be able to look for any proposed rules and regulations at any given time. Um, and like you said, I think there's this is as simple as copying and pasting some text into a form. This is the kind of thing that I could build on you know, Google Forms in you know, an hour. It's um, copy and paste the rule and regulation, have a box for which agency it's coming from, and having something that can categorize these things by agency. So people can say, if I'm looking for a DPW rule and regulation that's being proposed, let me go to all the DPW rules and regs, something like that. You know, this is very, very simple, very basic stuff. Um, and so I think, I think that we're good. Um, can I, if, if we are, if we're all in agreement, I'd still like to have then on page five, line 19, where it says, in addition, the city solicitor shall maintain an online register of all proposed. Can, if we can have an addition here, just an insertion. In addition, the city solicitor, comma, with the assistance of the Baltimore City Information and Technology, comma, uh, and so on with that line. I just want to make sure that we have BCIT's assistance in here uh, to do this easy task, presumably. That's incredible. Sounds good to me. Um, <clears throat> okay, before we um, before we jump to public comment and then uh, discuss the actual amendments that have been proposed, uh, do the sponsors or DLR or the law department, mayor's office or council president's office have anything else they want to add? All right. Yeah, Mr. Chair, Mr. Chair, um, I've been texting with Councilman Dorsey about it. Um, I do think that it might be prudent. Um, uh, earlier in the conversation, we talked about um, DLR might need some additional um, uh, staffing, et cetera. Um, and so it might be prudent, even if it's uh, if, if we move the bill today, I just want to loop in find out to get something on record from them just to make sure that we know what that would look like. I, I think we're going to hold off on moving the bill today anyway, uh, with the aim of getting the bill the second reader on uh, September 21st. Um, I want to make sure that we have the appropriate language drafted up for the BSIT amendment, uh, that we do have a conversation with BSIT uh, and Department of Law and DLR so we all understand what BSIT's responsibilities are going to be here and that they're able to do it. And to your point, Caitlin, that we can have a conversation with finance to make sure that, you know, whatever needs DLR has are taken care of as well so that we can successfully implement this thing. So I think that that makes all the sense in the world and appreciate the, the suggestion. Uh, anyone else? 
Yeah, I, I want to add, I would be remiss, it's Dick Turtle again, I would be remiss if I didn't uh, say that the law department is also concerned about the onslaught, the, the initial onslaught of, uh, of regulations in this period uh, uh, get, to get old regulations in place. Uh, I don't know that we need temporary help. Maybe we do, maybe we don't. I just don't, we just don't really have an idea about what's coming. Uh, and that's one of the unknowns about this particular bill. We don't know what's coming initially, and we don't know how this sort of pans out uh, routinely after this bill takes effect. Uh, so it's a little bit of an unknown, uh, and it's hard to get a grasp exactly what the burden, the administrative burden is going to be here. I think that's agreed, but I think we can always come back to the table um, with council members to say, hey, we need more time to do X, Y, and Z. Um, so I think it's, we hear you, but it's something that we should keep going, that we shouldn't slow up. And if we need to come back to the table to say, hey, update, and I think we should have updates anyway to let us know of what it looks like. Thank you, Councilwoman. And in my, um, if I may, Mr. Chair, I'm sorry. Um, uh, in our conversations, one of the things that I noted was that we should be, and I certainly will take, um, you know, the role of, of leading this, um, should be asking that agencies submit their existing rules and regs to the law department at the very earliest opportunity. Um, we don't want all of the agent the bill gives and we'll talk about this with some of the amendments is that the, but the bill gives agencies a whole year from the time of enactment to submit their existing rules and regulations for codification um and so we don't want them all to be dumping them on the law department for review uh you know in the 11th month we want to be encouraging agencies to get them in early so that the law department is able to spread out their review of these rules and regs over you know a long period of time um and the same would go for dlr um the bill does not necessarily actually speak to how quickly the cobra has to be built out just how just the time frame in which the agencies have to submit their existing rules and regulations if they want to get them in uh, the, the, and so um there is leeway here for both the law department and for dlr to spread out but i want to i, I want to encourage agencies to get their existing rules and regs in at the very earliest opportunity so that they can spread them out. The law and DLR can spread that workload out over time. Anyone else, uh, co-sponsors, agencies, council president or mayor's office? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is uh, Matt Stegman from the mayor's office. Um, you, I think you already uh, answered my concern, but uh, I just, you know, wanted to, to say uh, we would appreciate uh, if the uh, committee would not advance this bill today, if we could have another work session after we've had the opportunity to consult with uh, finance and visa. And it sounds like that is what's going to happen. So uh, just, I just, I thank everybody in advance for that. Yes, sir. I think we're all in agreement on that. That's the, that's the prudent approach. So make sure we get it right. Uh, anyone else? Okay, Matt, can you uh, let us know how many folks are on to testify from the public? Thank you, Mr. Chair. It looks like we only have one attendee from the public, um, uh, Teresa Milio Berg. Apologies. I don't need to say anything, thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I think that is the only uh, was the only attendee. Teresa, thank you very much for joining us for a um, extremely detailed uh, topic today. I, I didn't expect as many people to show up to the hearing as as we did. So, um, okay, uh, let's move on to 
the amendments from the two co-sponsors. Uh, if you want to, um, what I'd like to do is take these, we'll vote on these amendments one by one. Um, if you could just explain what each amendment does before we uh, take a motion on them. So let's start with amendment one, please. Sure, I'll take this on. Um, uh, amendment one uh, satisfies a concern. Um, it is 20, a concern raised by the chair. Uh, it is 2020. There is some language in this bill that says that when listing proposed rules and regula regulations, an agency has to include uh, in the information about for, for giving public comment, it says uh, an email address if available. It's 2020. Amendment number one here strikes if available. We have an expectation that an agency will have an email address at which the public can uh, submit public comment. I appreciate you utilizing the exact language. Uh, that was my justification for the request for that amendment. Is there a motion to move amendment one? So moved. Motion by Sneed. Is there a second? I'll second it. All those in favor say aye. 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 Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes. Aye. All those opposed say nay. Amendment is adopted. Amendment number two. Amendment number two um, addresses the primary, the biggest concern in the law department's uh, report. Um, of overstepping the legislative authority of the city council. Um, and what this does is scales it back from a process by which the city council could essentially reject and overturn a uh, proposed rule and regulation to a process um, that is comparable to the state's process um, where uh, members of the council could um, present a letter um, that would hold up the process for 60 days. And um, during that time, the council could, you know, or those members um, who are proposing the whole, you know, or are requesting the hold um, would be able to, you know, make a bunch of noise and get the public stirred up or hold a committee hearing in the Legislative Investigations Committee um in order to draw attention to this rule and regulation and again as i said in my opening remarks um this is intended uh uh as is stated in the amendment um the con the committee shall consider whether the proposed regulation is in conformity with the statutory authority of the agency and reasonably complies with the legislative intent of the statute under which the regulation was approached uh, uh, proposed so this is not really about saying, well, I have a bone to pick with this agency, so I'm going to just be an obstacle, be an obstructionist. Um, this is really about saying the agency is propose proposing a rule or regulation that is just really out of step with um, the intent of the law. Um, so this is a basic kind of check and balance process here, but not one that allows the council to overstep its authority. Is there a motion to move that amendment? So moved. Motion by Sneed. Is there a second? Second. Second by Pinkett. All those in favor say aye. 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 All, aye. Those, all those opposed say nay. Motion carries. Amendment is adopted. Amendment number three. Amendment number three uh, addresses another concern that was raised by the chair. Um, and I thought this was a really good catch um, in the bill. Basically, one of the things that this bill does is um, particularly considering COVID and the current state of emergency, it's had us looking at um, the adoption of rules and regulations um, in an uncommon light. Uh, this bill allows that if a rule or regulation is adopted under an emergency state, that 
its effect carries on for 90 days after the conclusion of the state of emergency. And it's reasonable, I think, to expect that city agencies are going to have their hands full during a state of emergency and even for some time period afterward. And um, while a ruler regulate and, and there's also the possibility, and I think that we've seen this um, with certain street closures and things like this, that there are um, rules or regulations that come about during a state of emergency that would not otherwise come about and that we realize along the way, actually, this is really great. We should keep doing this beyond the state of emergency. If an agency does not submit that ruler reg for permanent adoption um, in a perfectly timely fashion, we don't want them to have to terminate the uh, implementation of that ruler regulation on a temporary, you know, a, a temporary termination while it goes through the official process. What this amendment says is that if they admit, if they submit the proposed ruler regulation to the APA process during that 90 days that the can, that the temporary rule can extend on beyond that 90 days while the rule goes through the APA process. In practical terms, it that has the potential to extend the rule for up to 29 more days. Um, and if there's a hold letter, it could go to up to 89 days but uh, beyond that 90 days. But this is, um, I think this uh, just foresees a very, very limited, um, rare kind of circumstance, but makes a reasonable provision. I'm sorry, that's a really hard one to explain. Um, I hope that I conveyed it at least half adequately. Is there a motion to move Amendment 3? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Second. Uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say nay. Uh, amendment is adopted. Amendment number four. Okay, amendment number four. Um, <clears throat> again, uh, the chair is an astute observer, a detailed reader of uh, legislation and one of the things that we discussed uh, over several meetings was um, the implementation period uh, for the various aspects of this bill and how the various uh, timelines overlap. Um, this bill, as I've mentioned a couple of times during this hearing, allows agencies one year to submit uh, any existing rules or regulations to uh, be codified in the COBRA. Um, uh, and, uh, but as drafted, would give agencies a half a year in which they could come up with rules or regulations and submit them without going through the APA process. Um, that has the potential. I'm not saying that we have bad actors in city agencies, but maybe we do. Um, and there's the possibility an agency that has not kept up with its promulgation of rules and regulations um, could, you know, hypothetically write their whole book of rules and regulations in that six month period and submit them um, and uh, circumvent the whole APA process, circumvent the entire purpose of this bill. Um, and so shortening that period from six months down to two months, um, you know, it allows that, say, if an agency is right now in the process of coming up with a rule um, that they can carry on their process right now, but 60 days from the time of enactment, um, they're going to have to start adhering to the APA process for the development of any new rules. Um, so it just uh, it gives them gives them a good buffer, but not an excess, excessive line uh, timeline that could be potentially exploited. Thank you, Councilman. Is there a motion to move Amendment Four? 
So moved. Thank you, Councilwoman. Is there a second? Second. Second by Pinkett. All those in favor say aye. 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 All, aye. Those, all those opposed say nay. Motion carries. Amendments adopted. Um, Victor, I want to just hop back to your um, your agency comments letter. So this the first item, we've resolved all your concerns. That's correct. Related to the amendments, okay. Uh, the second one, um, we agreed that we're going to come up with a new amendment that adds in a third option there. I think it's in Dorsey, Councilwoman Sneed, and Victor, do I have that correct? That's correct. Okay. Um, Tony, as I assume we will be asking you to write this amendment for us, which is five words. Um, do you have any concerns if we were to move that amendment now? Um, just, uh, I stated my concern earlier. Uh, I continue it. Just, uh, you might want to think about a way to frame this amendment to avoid the possibility that an agency declares something to be obsolete and it can circumvent the repeal uh, of that. Normally, it would have to go through the APA process by just going through this avenue. All right, so we'll hold off on that one. Everyone's good with that? Yes. Okay. But either way, Victor, you're fine with where we're at right now for number two, correct? Yes, I am. Yes. All right, good. Thank you. Um, Amendment or uh, issue number three in your letter. I think we were at peace with this one. We're good with that. Okay. And then issue number four um, sounded like we're going to add in um, an amendment that says with the assistance of BSIT. That, that's correct. On, on, on page five, line 19. All right. Do we. Um, Tony, is that something you would prefer that would it be your preference that we hold off on, on voting on an amendment that we don't have drafted for that until we've had those conversations with BSIT? Yeah, I mean, just it might make it cleaner if we had the discussion with BSIT first rather yeah. than having to retract an amendment. Right. Okay. Everyone's good with that? Yes. Okay. So that takes care of law, that takes care of DLR, um, we've taken care of the mayor's office concerns, and we've taken care of um, council president office concerns. So we need to figure out these two amendments. Um, we also need to have a conversation with BSIT and Department of Finance. Is there anything left on the laundry list to get this bill to uh, a vote in the committee? I think it's just those four items. Two amendments, convo with these and convo with finance, correct? That's my understanding. Okay. Uh, Matt Peters, can you pull up the calendar, please? Um, are we able to reconvene on Tuesday, September 15th at 10 a.m.? There, I think. Uh, I think the health committee has a uh, hearing scheduled in that time slot already, fortunately. Okay. Yes, that's, that's correct. They already have something scheduled? Yes, sir. Uh, yes. yes. Okay. Um, do you know what time they're, they're, we expect them to be done? Is that going to be a long hearing? Or? I think that hearing, uh, that's, I think that's coming from our office in that hearing is um, probably going to be maybe an hour, max an hour and a half. So if you do say new, yeah. Committee members, uh, does that work for your schedules? New on Tuesday, September 15th. Mr. Chair, I, um, I think the um, health committee also can has we, an 1130. Wait, Matt, can we have hearings at the same time now because they're virtual? Uh, Yes, Mr. Chair, I think it's possible. Um, I'm not sure how much overlap off the top of my head there is between uh, judiciary oh, and health. members. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. That's right. Um, so, committee members, are there any concerns with having a hearing at, at noon on 
the 15th? Yeah. Eric, Councilman Weisinger, I'm good. Yep. All right. Stokes, you good? I'm looking at it now, Mr. Chair. Um, All right. Councilwoman Sneed? Yeah. I'm good. It's fine. Dorsey? Uh, Mr. Chair, I'm not available that, that day, but um, I trust that the committee, I'm not a committee member, I trust that the committee can handle this and that um, Roman Sneed is here, and, but I'm not available that day. Mr. Chairman? Yes, sir. Um, I think Matt Peters had mentioned it, and I just looked it up on Legistar. Um, actually, the health committee also has 1130. It's, on, it's, it's one big block on my account, which is why I didn't see it. But they have 10 o'clock, and then they have the 1130, which is a pesticide control and regulation bill, which may take some time. Oh, Councilman Dorsey, you're out of town until the 16th. Yes, I'm out of town from the 10th through the, uh, through the 16th. Oh, your text message said, oh, I, oh, my bad. Yeah, I didn't put the wrong October, month in there. That, I'm right. sorry, my bad. No, no, it's all good. Um, what about Thursday? Thursday the 17th? So you have taxation hearing? Yeah, we have taxation at 10. Uh, let me look at what's on the agenda. I have labor. You have labor at one. Yeah. Oh, uh, we're gonna have a lengthy hearing for. Her. Hey. But I think we can get it in on the seventh because it's uh, the amendment won't take that long. You, oh, have you already heard both of those bills? Yeah. So All we right. could possibly get our stuff in this year. Three p.m. on on Thursday. Works or for me. Before then, I, I'm tied up at one from like one till uh, just right up to about three. So three o'clock is as close as I can cut it. Matt, can we can we go into recess and without announcing when the hearing is going to be and just get get this figured out over email this afternoon? Uh, yes, Mr. Oh, Chair, okay. for a work session, we can just um, have Natana announce it through. All right. All right. Yeah, let's let's do that. I'll start an email thread with all the appropriate folks. In a minute. Um, OK. All right. We're going to uh, thank you all. We're now in recess. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.